my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm a Tolkien geek, and in this video, I want to talk about something that came up while I was listening to the Tolkien professors exploring the Lord of the Rings series, on which I am roughly 70 episodes behind, so don't take this as a this is where he's at type thing. Uh, and he brings up an interesting parallel, which I had never thought of before, between what happens in Crick Hollow after the four main hobbits leave and what happens much, much later in the story at the gates of Minas Tirith. And I'll get into that. Uh, I want to talk about what he mentions, but I also went and looked and found a few other parallels of my own, because after he mentioned it, I was like, hmm, I bet you there's more to this than he actually goes into, and sure enough, there was. Uh, so I'll kind of distinguish between what he talked about and what I found by myself. Um, but before I get into that, I do have two new Patreon subscribers, thank you very much, that I need to give a shout out to. One is S. Brown, and the other is Crystal. Thank you both very much for subscribing uh, on Patreon. If anybody else wants to do that, of course, the link is in the description below, and there will be uh, a link at the end of the video as well. That said, let's take a look at the parallels between Crick Hollow and Minas Tirith. So first of all, for a little bit of background for those who aren't as familiar with the books, it, th the stage when the hobbits are in Bree, they left behind another hobbit to kind of keep up pretenses that Frodo is living in Crick Hollow, which is part of the eastern, it's not technically in the Shire, but it's basically in the Shire to the east of the Brandywine River. And it's Fatty Bulger who's basically holding down the fort. And at the same time that the hobbits are in Bree, there are black riders also in the Shire who are hunting for Frodo, and they end up breaking into the house that Fatty Bulger is staying at, where Frodo had allegedly moved to. And this is kind of where I'm at in this in the Exploring the Lord of the Rings series, is they've made it to Bree, and so they've come to the point where this happens in this in the story. So while the hobbits are in Bree, the Tolkien professor goes back and looks at this passage which is given at this point and says you know there's some interesting parallels here between what happens at Crick Hollow and then what happens later at the Battle of the Palenor Fields at Minas Tirith and one of those parallels of course you've got black riders in both instances at the the later instance of course you have the witch king himself who rides into the gates of Minas Tirith but the interesting parallels that he notes are you have um, at, in Crick Hollow, and by the way, I've actually talked about this scene in a previous video, and specifically in um, my Halloween special that I did a while back on creepy scenes in Lord of the Rings. I'll link to that below, so if you're not familiar with the actual scene, you can get a pretty good overview of it there, but I'm kind of hitting the main highlights here anyway, but if you're interested. So, Fatty Bulger is staying at this house, and what we learn when we get this kind of side scene while the hobbits are in Bree is that there's this one particular day where he feels uneasy the whole time and at night he starts to see and uh, you know it starts to feel even worse and he's like something's bad something bad is going to happen so he sees a gate which opens seemingly by itself and basically the implication here is that it's a black rider without anything to cover himself and so he's just invisible like the ring rates are so he bolts the door, and what we find out a little bit later is that he runs basically as soon as he gets any indication that something bad is going to happen, so he doesn't get killed or caught or anything like that. But there are three, at least three black riders who come up, and they basically wait out Fatty Bulger, or who, what they think is the ring bearer potentially, for what seems to be quite a long time. And... The first indication that we get of the exact time is finally we get a cock crowing and it says it's the last cold hour before dawn. So basically in the really early morning, you know, there's a cock crow and then the black riders end up breaking down the door. And then almost immediately after that, they hear a horn call and the Buckland horn call that is apparently well known to everybody but hasn't been used for a long time because there's been no need occurs and that's you know fatty bulger makes his way to some house and he's basically spouting what seems to be gibberish but they get the idea something's wrong and so they sound the alert and the horn call is uh 
we don't know what the sounds are exactly, but it, it involves the words awake, fear, fire, foes, awake. And so it's the idea of wake up, something bad's happening. And he mentions that the parallels here are pretty interesting because you've got in Minas Tirith in the Battle of the Polenor Fields, you have kind of similar issues. And this, the order of events is slightly mixed up because it's after the Witch King rides in that you get the Cock Crow, which is then answered by the Horns of Rohan. So those are kind of the main points of the parallel that the Tolkien professor brought up. And I thought to myself, you know, I have a feeling there's a little bit stronger of a parallel if you look into the details, because I had been over that scene recently because of the, the, you know, the dramatic reading I did for Tolkien Reading Day recently, where I read parts of the story from when the Rohirrim arrived at Minas Tirith. And of course, that's who the horns are. And so I was remembering what Theoden said, and sure enough, there are some additional parallels that I think are worth mentioning. So let's talk about those. So when Theoden and the riders arrive, or actually just before they arrive, Theoden kind of gives them a speech about, you know, here's what's about to happen. You know, you're about to win glory and you might die, but, it, you know, it's all for the greater good, that sort of thing. Uh, paraphrasing really badly here. But anyway, the point is, in his speech, he mentions that fire and foes are before them. Now, if you remember the horn call of Buckland, fear fire foes awake. So he's kind of using some of the same types of words in his in his speech before they get there. Once they start to enter the Polenor fields and then he ends up taking a horn and blowing it and then he you know shouts some verses. And in the verses he also mentions fire and slaughter. But even more interesting I think is the fact that he begins his verses with Arise, Arise, Riders of Theoden. And the reason I think that's interesting is one of the points that the Tolkien professor brought up is the fact that you can kind of tell what the horn call sounds like in the horn call of Buckland because the idea of awake, fear, fire, foes, awake, you get the idea that it's and it's that Arise, Arise, Riders of Theoden, you know, it's kind of a same kind of a feel to it. And so you almost wonder if that was a deliberate metrical echo sort of of what happened in in the Buckland rhyme. So it was interesting to me to see how that also added a little bit of parallel as well. But there's also some other stuff that's interesting that's not exactly direct parallel, but I think is significant. And that is Crick Hollow, which is where the house is that the Black Riders break into, is in Buckland, which is, like I said earlier, not technically part of the Shire, but it's the area that's kind of generally most populated with Brandy Bucks, Mary being the heir to the main line of the Brandy Buck family. And then, of course, not only that, Mary is also the one who has kind of a run-in with a Black Rider in Bree the night before the Black Riders, well, actually, it's the same night, but I mean, like, if you measure by it, 12 a.m. being the next day, it's they're technically doing it the morning right after Mary runs into a Black Rider in Bree. If you're not familiar with Mary running into a Black Rider in Bree, I don't think I've actually done a video covering that, but if you watch the Ralph Bakshi version of The Lord of the Rings, the animated, he actually covers that, unlike Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson doesn't touch that issue, but Ralph Bakshi does. So if you catch, if you find a way to watch his, you can get that. But I mean, the short version is Mary doesn't actually join Frodo, Sam, and Pippin in the common room of the Prancing Pony. He goes out for a walk and then ends up running into a black rider. Of course, it's also Mary who will end up helping to kill the Witch King much later on at the Battle of the Polenor Fields. But what kind of ties it all together, which I think is really interesting, is after all of that happens, and Theoden dies and everything, after the ring is destroyed, after all of that, uh, the hobbits and Aragorn and a few other people ride up to Rohan for the, the burial of Theoden, his funeral. And after that's said and done, Eomer and Eowyn give Mary a gift in parting, and it's basically a, a horn, which apparently was taken from a dragon's horde many, many, who knows how many years ago, and they basically say, if you 
you know, blow it, help will come, more or less. And he ends up using that exact same horn much later in the scouring of the Shire, and I've done a video on the scouring, and I can link to that as well. And he will use that horn to call the Mer the, uh, the the Buckland corn call in the scouring of the Shire to get help from all the hobbits around to help them finish their uh, mission there. And so you can kind of see this thread all the way through this, that not only do you have the parallels of the two scenes, but Mary is kind of present in some way at both because Mary, we just had Mary interact with the Black Rider. Black Riders break into the house at Crick Hollow, which is the general region from where Mary is. Mary then helps kill the Witch King at the other end of this and then ends up using a horn given to him by Aomer to make the same exact horn call all the way pretty much at the end of the story. So I just thought that that was really neat how not only do you have this parallel, but you've got Mary kind of stranded through the entire thing and it ends up making a closed loop on itself. So I thought that was really, really cool and just wanted to point that out because, you know, totally inspired by the Tolkien professor, but I don't know, obviously his exploring Lord of the Rings hasn't gotten anywhere near, uh, he's not even finished with the Fellowship of the Ring yet. So I don't know if he's thought of this yet or not because he hasn't got that far and I haven't caught up with where he even is. But I thought that this was really cool and wanted to go a little bit beyond what even he mentions in the Exploring the Lord of the Rings series. So really, really cool how Tolkien does this. And it's a good example of how Tolkien really sees the whole story kind of all at once. And you can tell how going back and revising things really helped him to put a lot of things together that might not otherwise have been you know, really meshed in, in that kind of a way. So I just really wanted to share that and give an example of how cool the Lord of the Rings is if you can really get a big picture view of it as well. So, hope you enjoyed that video. Hope that was an interesting exercise in some literary analysis. And if you do like it, please do give it a thumbs up, share it around. If you want to subscribe to me on Twitter at JRRTLore, or follow me, I should say, at Twitter, You'll occasionally get some Tolkien trivia questions out of me, and you can, of course, subscribe to the channel here. You can also, of course, support the channel here, and you can find two of my previous videos here. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namariye.